Let me now move to our stance on drugs. Mr. D'Souza, Mr. Bayam King, Mr. Desmond Chu, Mr. Edwin Tong spoke about the global challenge. The results from a 2016 National Council Against Drug Abuse Survey shows a slightly worrying trend. Our young people are adopting a slightly more open attitude towards drugs compared with a similar survey done three years earlier, 2013, especially towards cannabis. I think the internet, the social media, the pro-legalization lobby in the US are telling them it is cool and it is safe to take cannabis. But if you look at the research, well-supported research, it tells us that cannabis is harmful, especially in teenagers, because it can cause irreversible brain damage. We have to stay firm in this fight against drugs. We are also studying how we can enhance the MDA, Misuse of Drugs Act, to deal with new threats. Over the past year, the drug situation in the world has continued to worsen. The US declared that the opioid crisis they face is a public health emergency. The US National Center for Health Statistics estimated that almost 64,000 people died from drug overdose in 2016. 64,000 people, that number is more than the number of US soldiers who died in the Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq wars combined. It's more than the number of people who have died with, through breast cancer in the US. It's more than the number of people who have died in HIV and AIDS-related deaths in the US at the peak of the epidemic. The media has covered extensively on how big pharma, poor regulation, irresponsible proliferation of poor quality research, often funded by the pharma companies, have all combined to create this crisis. In May 2017, the US federal court found top executives from Purdue Pharma guilty of misleading regulators, doctors, patients about the risks of OxyContin, which is a powerful and addictive opioid. They earned billions from their deception. Patients graduated from snorting or injecting the crushed pills then turning to heroin and other drugs to feed their addiction. Despite the harm caused by drugs, some countries have been softening their stance. Countries such as Portugal have decriminalized drug use, and they have received international attention for this approach. And there are some people here who tell us Portugal is a great example to follow and shows why our approach is wrong and Portugal's approach is right. But do the facts bear that out? And what are the lessons for us from the Portugal situation? First, Portugal started with a serious public health problem on its hands. It had many heroin abusers. They were sharing contaminated needles. And they were spreading diseases like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. More than half of HIV infections were drug-related, which was the highest rate in the European Union. Portugal then decided to decriminalize drugs. It increased funding for treatment facilities. It provided for needle exchange and opioid substitution therapy. It ran campaigns, say no to secondhand syringe. These measures have helped Portugal reduce HIV and hepatitis infections. But when you start with serious HIV-related problems, hepatitis, infection-related problems, arising through drug use, contaminated needles, then I suppose you ask yourself which is the lesser evil, and you go for decriminalization, and then you try and reduce the problem somewhat. Uh, but we are not in that situation, thankfully. And there are trade-offs from Portugal's approach. 
the lifetime prevalence of drug use in Portugal has increased since decriminalization. Surveys now indicate that more Portuguese students are trying drugs, and the number of drug-related deaths have also gone up since 2011. So you will not find all these facts from the people who advocate that we go down the route of Portugal. Portugal decided to decriminalize drugs in a situation where perhaps it concluded that it was not possible or unrealistic for it to control the drug situation. The situation we have in Singapore is different. Our approach has been effective and has worked well for us. We are one of the few countries where the drug situation has been under control and perhaps the country that has been most effective in dealing with the problem. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, can I display a slide on the screen, please? This, uh, we can have many slides, but this sort of shows you uh, what the trends have been over a period of time in terms of drug use. And if we ignore the downward blip for a period when people abuse Subutex, then you see that it's actually it's probably a fairly smooth curve. There was not a real dip in certain years because people were using Subutex. And then we outlawed that, and then they went back to other drugs. The number of drug abusers we have in Singapore is relatively low compared with some of the other jurisdictions. For example, the number of opiate abusers in Singapore is less than 30 per 100,000 people. In Portugal, the number is almost 500. In the US, the number is 600, 20 times our number. Uh, in Portugal, it is, uh, well, just under 20 times. And the numbers will grow further in the US because of the move towards legalization in many states. Intravenous drug use is not a significant mode of HIV transmission in Singapore. So you think of the lives that have been saved, the misery, the deprivation, the loss. We have saved a lot of people from that. If you just look at that slide, from something near 7,000 people being arrested per year to something in the region of 3,000 plus being arrested now. If you take that as three to 4,000 lives per year over a 20-year period, it's a lot of lives. A lot of people who have been served from drugs. This result has been possible because we have been tough on drugs. And we should not ease up. You look at the cases, and anecdotally. Just this Monday, CNB arrested a trafficker in a drug bust. During the investigations, officers discovered that, and it was a lady, she was a caregiver to a toddler. She had left him with two uh, other suspected drug traffickers. Concerned about their toddler's safety, CNB and police then moved quickly uh, with operations the very next day to take down two suspects. The young child was rescued, is now with Child Protection Services. How old is a child? One year old. In that one year, the young child had already been abandoned by his mother, who is on the run for drug offenses, and being passed around between drug traffickers. Now, this is, these are not isolated cases. In many other countries, these are par for the course. We don't want to get there. In another case, a drug addict father abused his baby daughter, very cruel, regularly biting her. One day he was furious because he had no money to buy drugs. The baby cried, as babies do. He shoved her against the wall so hard, her skull fractured. She was 10 months old, not old enough to defend herself. These are the victims of drugs. The activists light candles for traffickers outside Changi prison. They write emotive stories. They dream up about their lives. But who cares for these very real victims? How many young lives have we saved with our policies? 
would you hear a squeak from the activists about these people? The actual victims of burglaries, house breakings, families torn apart through drugs, the physical violence, the mental abuse, and by a process of uh, estimation, the number of people who have been saved from that, the shootings and the killings that take place in other countries where drug abuse is prevalent. The 60,000 people who died through opioid abuse doesn't capture all the deaths in the US. There are many more gangland violence with drugs as the underlying cause. The shootings with guns, weapons. You have another case in Singapore. Nine-year-old bo boy living with his abusive aunt. He saw her doing drugs. He ran away because he was scared of being beaten again when she was under the influence of drugs. But she found him, hit him, burnt him with a lighter, picked him up, and dangled him out of a third-story window. Our CNB officers recently came across another abuser, seven months pregnant, still smoking ice. She already had a previous miscarriage because of her ice habit. But her addiction was so strong, she persisted anyway at the expense of her unborn, innocent child. And again, from foreign jurisdictions, you see cases where children are born with addiction inbuilt and they need and they crave for heroin from the time they are born. Who speaks for these defenseless victims? As I said earlier, the self-styled activists refuse to talk about how the addiction of hundreds of abusers is fed with each shipment that these traffickers bring in. How many families suffer as a result of drugs? Our penalties are severe because we want to deter such offenses, not because we take any joy in enforcing them. No one can take any joy in enforcing them. Our regional drug situation remains challenging. The region is home to the Golden Triangle, which is the largest meth market in the world. Trafficking of heroin and meth in this region alone is estimated to generate over US $32 billion annually. It is a very lucrative business. It's not going to go away. So let's not kid ourselves. International criminal syndicates operate in this region, attracted by the profits. Me, being a major transport and commercial hub makes us susceptible, both as a transit point and as an import market because of the Wealth factor. It's beyond our ability to change factors outside of Singapore. What we can do is to try and deter criminals from attempting to bring drugs into Singapore. And we have to be firm in resisting those who try to force their ideologies on us. Uh, Parliamentary Secretary Amrin uh, will elaborate on how we are working with various stakeholders on this. Thank you, sir.